Uh, we are starting our 2021 STEM talks. And before we get started, let me tell you a little bit. Last year, we ended the year in a very, very high. We had our conference, we had our community day, we had over 6,000 individuals joining us from everywhere from UK, Mexico, 42 states, um, Puerto Rico, and DC. We had individuals that spoke to us from like Danny Olivas, who went into space, spent some time in, in, in the space station. We had Jose Hernandez. We had Dr. Calvin Mackey and DJ Venus. And we had an incredible experience with all of you. So we ended the, the year in a really, really high for all of our, our participants. We're starting the year, in, in my opinion, equally or even with such an incredible speaker uh, that we're bringing to you all. Dr. Rich, Richard Tapia from Rice University, an individual has received so many honors and I won't name them all because I would like for Dr. Tapia to share them with you. I will let you know that some of them, he is the first Latino to receive the, the um, recognition. And in some of those, he's still the only Latino to receive those recognitions. So without any further ado, Dr. Tapia, I turn the, the mic over to you. What I want to do is, you know, uh, tell you about my life. So my life, the, the title of, of my talk is My Unlikely Journey from the Barrios of Los Angeles to the White House and the National Medal of Science. So that's a long trip, okay? And there's a lot of things in between. So I just want to share with you my life. Hopefully, it will motivate you to, to continue in your pursuits, and, and that's what we're doing. So let's go with my life, okay? As I grew up in Los Angeles, okay, my parents were from Mexico, I, I always fought uh, for identity. So there's an identity crisis for underrepresented minorities growing up in the United States, and especially if you're good in science, engineering, and mathematics. They tell you, you don't belong. Why are you there? And I had that situation in high school and, and, and beyond, okay? And even a struggle for identity. You know, in the United States, I was called Mexican. And, and I said, you know, and in Mexico, when we went to visit, I was called gringo. So I said, where do I belong? Okay. You know, they don't hear this, they call me Mexican, and in Mexico, they call me gringo. Okay. And I had to grow up with this image, sort of a negative image with the term Mexican American. Okay. And the implicit belief was, your kind is not quality. You do not belong in uh, quality activity. Now, if you're all your life, you don't belong. You're not supposed to do it. Okay. Even if you're upfront, you don't accept it. Sometimes when you have to cope with failure, and everybody co 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 copes with failure. I mean, failure is a part of every successful person's life. You have to start to say in the back of your mind, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I don't belong. Okay. But my mother from Chihuahua, Mexico, was the proudest woman in the world. I mean, no one was more proud than my mother. And she said, be proud of who you are. Okay? But she, she grew up in Mexico. And I say, but mom, they, they won't let me be proud. Okay? I want to be, but I want to. And so I asked the question, who am I? I've always had to deal with you. Okay? I'm born and raised in the United States. So I mean, I'm certainly a, a American. I'm not Mexican. I wasn't born in Mexico. But who am I? So I looked for words that I felt that felt close to my heart, words that I identified it with. Now I grew up a long time ago. I grew up, you know, in the '60s, late '50s and '60s. So there was a, a movement in Los Angeles called the Chicano movement, and that gave me an identity. I, in other words, I was Mexican American, and I cared about the issues. And um, to be a Chicano. You didn't have to speak perfect Spanish, which I did not speak perfect Spanish, but I could have inside my heart a caring for la gente, for us. Then I came to Texas, and I've been in Texas for 50 years, and I really embraced the word Tejano, and I really embraced what Selena did for the image. I mean, Selena was wonderful. I, I happened to see her a couple times, and actually I have a video uh, with Becky Lee Mesa, who played Selena in the movie, when a young age, she and I have a video together. So I'm very proud of that. Then mathematician, I'm a mathematician and I'm proud of that too. My daughter asked me, dad, do you love mathematics? And I say, yes. And she said, I don't see how anybody can love mathematics. And I said, well, I do, Becky. And so th those are the things that in my heart, if you look in the corners, 
you see a little piece of Chicano, Tejano, and mathematician. Okay. Here's a picture of me. So that's what uh, Tejano, uh, Chicano mathematician looks like. This was on the cover of Sakna's News. And they wanted to sort of present an image of, of as I said, uh, a Chicano mathematician. And so this went, this actually was very widely spread. And I got a note from uh, President Clinton in the White House saying that he enjoyed this. Okay. So I usually ask people what uh, year is that car, and, but I'm not going to ask because we have this uh, remote operate. But it's a 57 Chevy. A 57 Chevy is the canonical representer for uh, um, for classic cars. Okay, and not only that, there's sort of inherent like on the part of Mexicans towards Chevrolets. So that, that you know that's just the way it happened. I think there's a part. Of, in our genes that says you like Chevrolets. Okay, my parents look. All parents are beautiful. Magda and Amado. Magda was born in Chihuahua, actually at the top of the Copper Canyon, Batapilas. And my father was born in Nayarit. And so they they met here in the United States. They did not meet it in Mexico. They came here as young people. What do you remember? Now, my father used to work so hard, and we were really raised by my mother. What did she teach us? Pride. Pride in who we were. Belief that you can. So she would, si se puede was used by my mother before Cesar Chavez made it popular. Okay? You can do it. Now, good work habits. She worked hard, and she taught us all. I have uh, a brother and a sister who are lawyers, and another brother who was in computer science. And then a thing that I want to hit on is global excellence. Implicitly, my mother said, global excellence. That means you're good across the wide spectrum. You're not good just because you're good for the family or good in the neighborhood or good in the city of Los Angeles. She asked, she taught us to uh, seek global excellence. Try to be as good as you can in a great broad environment, okay? So I want to start with our humble beginnings, okay? Now, I grew up with a twin brother named Bobby. And uh, our love, you have to figure the time when we grew up, the late 50s and early 60s, our first love was for cars. I mean, we were 10 years old, we were already working on cars. So that handsome person is me in uh, next to a 1957 Chevy. So this would be, I was 18 years old at that time. And so, uh, I look back at that with fondness, okay? Almost grown. We took the engine out of that Chevrolet and we actually built a dragster in uh, the garage, my mother and father's garage. And the dragster had a Chevy engine in it. In those days, uh, dragsters had Chryslers and Cadillac engines. So we made a little tiny Chevy dragster and we called that almost grown because it was not big. And there's a song from 19, I don't know, 55, 56 by Chuck Berry called Almost Grown. And so that, that was a good name for their car. This is Bobby, my brother. He worked for IBM. He was a uh, computer programmer. And so he got the nickname of the computerized driver. Okay. Now in a very famous uh, race, David and Goliath revisited in 1959 in a highly publicized match race, the little tiny Chevy, almost grown, had a match race with Art Arfons in the Green Monster. Now, Art Arfons and his brother Walt are legendary in American car history. They had world records, they had land speed records. So they were from Akron, Ohio. So Bobby the Giant Killer. So this is Bobby in front and the Green Monster behind. And of course we won. If we hadn't won, I wouldn't show you this, okay? Then Bobby continued to, go, uh, to move forward. And here is setting the most famous uh, drag strip in the, in, the, in the world was Lions. It was in Long Beach, California. And here's Bobby setting the uh, strip record in, in a car called uh, Tangare. We'll, we'll tell you more, okay? So this uh, picture comes courtesy of artist David Peters. But this is Bobby in the car called Tangare. And Tangare, we called it Tangare because gin and tonic was so popular in those days. And Tangare was a real popular uh, uh, brand. 
So the, and 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 so you get the flambe account. So so this picture is extremely popular, and it's uh, been circulated around the world. In 1968, Bobby set a world record in Tangray. Okay. 1968. In fact, it was February. I think February 13th. Okay, so there's a picture of Bobby and uh, his world record. Now, in 1968, I earned a PhD in mathematics from UCLA. Okay, so Bobby set a world record, and Richard got a PhD in mathematics. Okay, that would make my mother very, very proud. But my mother would have been proud of us even, you know, if we didn't have world records and PhDs. But I was the first in my family to go to college, so I didn't stop with a bachelor's. I got a PhD in math from UCLA. So I usually do this, and so we'll do this. I ask for an audience vote, and so when I see people in in in, in a, a live audience, I say, "What would you rather have? A world record in fuel dragster, or a PhD in mathematics from UCLA?" And I ask them to vote, and it's interesting the way the vote goes. It, it depends on where I am. Some people that say world record in field dragster or PhD in math from UCLA. So I will ask you to vote, but I won't see it. So just think, what would you rather have? A world record in field dragster, PhD in math from UCLA. Okay. Ah. I will tell everyone that they can submit the replies on the chat box and we can let Tapia know at the end which one of the two was selected the most, but all of you joining us. That would be fine, Rafael. I, I would love to see that because it, it does change you know, d depending on where I give the talk. Okay, and, and uh, last time I gave it at Rice, most of the people said, "Oh, they want to have a PhD." But anyway, so this is examples. So I, I've given you two examples of global excellence. Um, Bobby setting a world record. It wasn't the world's. He wasn't just the world's uh, uh, fastest in our neighborhood or in the city. It was the world. And uh, my PhD is essentially well respected. UCLA was a well respected school. So, those examples of world excellence, uh, I mean, of global excellence. Now, that was stage one cars, our love for cars. Okay. And, and it, it was, you know, it was really true and clean and sincere, and it molded us. Now, stage two is, on me is happiness and early successes. So, that's Gene. Jean is New Yorkan, uh, born and raised in New York, Puerto Rican. Her parents from Puerto Rico, and um, well, uh, when we got married, she was seventeen, about to turn eighteen, and I was nineteen, about to turn twenty. And so we were a cute couple. I mean, all young couples are cute. So that was our wedding. Okay. Then we were married in nineteen fifty nine. We had a daughter, Cersei, right away, and she's on the left. So when I started. Um, I was, I was actually a sophomore when I got married and a junior when Cersei was born. And when I got a PhD, we had a son, Richard. So celebrating a PhD was having a son, Richard. Jean just wanted to be a dancer. Jean grew up in New York. She studied at New York City Ballet. She loved dance. To her, it was simply dance, 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 clean and simple. And she was dancing even after we were married, of course. Our daughter, Cersei. Cersei had no choice. She grew up in the wings of stages. Everybody, I mean, everybody loved Cersei, and she, you know, she could, she could, she was dancing as soon as she was walking, or maybe even before. Now, academic successes. In 1970, I was hired by Rice. In 1972, I was promoted to associate professor with tenure. So that's a really, you know, it, in, in today's world, I don't think that could happen. But being promoted in two years was really an unusual thing. But I had to be promoted, and I'll tell you why, okay? There's a delicate balance. This is an incredibly important slide. Uh, slide. The delicate balance of academic success and outreach. How much outreach do I do to help students, and how much research do I do to essentially promote my own career? So in 1972, I knew in those days, that you had to have tenure before you started doing outreach activities on large scale. And there was a, a notion in those days that said, hire to fire. And they would hire a lot of minority uh, faculty, and then they would uh, fire them because nobody was keeping track of how many they fired. It was only keeping track of how many they hired. So I knew I needed tenure. Okay, 
Now, it's a time to embrace giving back in terms of addressing underrepresentation. Okay. I saw students that needed help. I could help. I have been there. I understand. I have tenure. I can go ahead and do it. That was by design. So my tenure was by design, and I said, now it's time to help. Okay. So one of the first things uh, I did is I started uh, a student group for um, basically today you'd say Latino, but it was called Ramas, Rice Association of Mexican American Students. See, up to say, let's say seventies, the dominant Latino in the Southwest was the Mexican Mexican heritage. There weren't these, you know, sort of elaborate others, you know, from other countries. They were just Mexican. Okay, and so all the groups, like when I was at UCLA, the groups always had Mexican in the title. So what do you? I look at nineteen seventy two. Um, I look at the beautiful hair that we had. Look, there's Danny and David and all of us, and, and we did have beautiful hair. That was a time of the 70s, and I, I'm proud of that. Now, things were going well. I had tenure, my career was good, I was doing outreach. So you understand that things were going really well for Gene and for me, and it's like a movie. When you watch a movie and you see that everything is going really well, you start to think, uh-oh, something bad is going to happen. So in the movie of my life, things were going good, but along came personal tragedies. In 1977, Jean, who loved nothing but dance, and she had a very successful dance studio in Houston. She had 450 students. That was her life. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and she couldn't dance anymore. She couldn't teach. So she had to go to a wheelchair. In 1979, it was myasthenia gravis. So that's two, multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis. But the biggest tragedy of all was 1982. Cersei had grown up in Houston. She went to the high school for the performing and visual arts. And she um, went to UCLA. She danced in the freshman class. And she said, I, I'm, I'm told that she was the only freshman to ever take the lead role in the freshman in, in the dance performance at UCLA. Then she told me, Dad, dance is not in universities. I'm going to New York. So she went to New York and she danced. And then she told me, Dad, there are 500 young women in New York that are better than I am. I'm coming back to Houston. I'm going to go to Rice. I'm going to study computer science. And I'm, you know, I will always enjoy dancing. But in 1982, on her way home from Rice, uh, she was a student at Rice, she was a sophomore, she was killed in an automobile accident. Okay, so that's a tragic thing that every day, even though it was more than 30 years ago, I, will, I remember it every single day of my life, okay? Jean said, three strikes, I'm out. Myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, so she's death. I'm over. And when she said over, she didn't want to live anymore. But I said, you have to cope, coping mechanisms. You have to return to dance. And I need to return to cars to deal with these tragedies. So I wanna show you Gene's video coming back. So Gene started a program for, uh, exercise program for people with multiple sclerosis in wheelchairs. And so I wanna show you a little bit of Gene's coming back. <laughs> I'm ready. Are you ready? And let's go for it. My name is Jean Tapia. I have multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis. Exercise has really improved the quality of my life, and I know it can be. Jean appears on national TV instructing the Los Angeles Multiple Sclerosis Society. Oh, yeah. Okay, now we have in our audience some members of the uh, Southern California chapter of the National MS Society, and I understand they are most anxious to share in this exercise program with you. What are you going to show them? Well, what Texans and MSers can do, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, ready. I'm ready if they're ready. Okay, go on over. Rob is there with them, so go on over. Sammy, to them thank you very them. much. We're so, I might say, too, these are just great upper body exercises for anyone. Uh, are you guys ready? Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Dean, over to you. All right, gang. Let's do it. Let's I'm going to exercise it. Too. All right. The first thing, let's just take a deep breath and lift up those arms. Inhale, exhale, lower those head and the shoulders down. Do it again. Feels good. Deep breath through the nose. Everybody do it. Exhale. Okay, so Jane, that was Jane's way of coming back and dealing with Cersei's death and with her multiple sclerosis and, and things. Now, when she was in L.A., that group of multiple sclerosis uh, people in wheelchairs in L.A., they didn't like this bouncy young Texan coming in. To, so they gave her a bad time. But I told her, Jane, just hang on. They're giving you a bad time. They actually made her cry. And I said, they're testing you. Hang on. And that was in rehearsal. And so when the live show came on, they were wonderful. And Gene succeeded. So that was Gene's way of coming back. Now, my way of coming back was going back to cars. So we built a, I, we built a car, 1970 Chevelle Malibu SS, called Heavy Metal. Okay. It was very, very successful. Now, I'm going to tell you right now. When I built a car, I didn't want people to say, oh, that's pretty nice for a professor. Oh, that's pretty nice for somebody else. I wanted it to be global excellence. I wanted this to be the top in the country and that's the car now notice that it has a flavor of me it has instead of, of uh had a monster uh painted uh in various places like on the license plate and stuff but that's me that's my my chicano background and me in in in, in this car and here we went all over the country showing the car Jean in her wheelchair and i remember one night in detroit michigan it was snowing and I was pushing Gene in the snow and we're laughing and having a great time. And we won again in Detroit. And that's Detroit's one of the most, oh, I guess, sophisticated car show cities. Los Angeles is fine. Detroit was number one. Example of global excellence, a car. Okay. A okay now we're going to go to stage five, a renewed commitment to understanding and improving representation in STEM. This is, I had to take a break. I had to deal with Cersei's death. I had to deal with various things, okay? So how are we underrepresented minorities doing in education? So the first thing I wanna say, I don't wanna spend much time on this, the blue line and the red line. The blue line says that we Hispanics are really good at dropping out of high school. That blue line that is, represents Hispanics dropping out of high school. And the red line says that Asians are really good at going to college and more. So they're the extreme points that we own the dropout rate and the Asians own the college rate. And you should not be surprised at that, okay? Now, for good reason, the nation uses representation in the areas of mathematics, computer science, and electrical engineering as indicators of health of STEM representation. So if you look at this chart, we don't want to spend too much time on it, but let's go to computer science. And this is faculty, the top 100 universities, the percentages. In computer science, we have less than 1% are black, less than 2% are Hispanic, and 27% are Asian. So I'm not faulting Asian. I have to compliment them. But they're 4% of the population, yet in computer science, they're 27% of the faculty. So we are indeed underrepresented. Look at electrical engineering. They're 28% of the faculty. Okay? So they have done well and we have not done well in representation. We mean black, Hispanics, and so Asians, okay? So, and yet, if you take the Hispanics and the blacks together, we're 31% of the national uh, population. We're 18% Hispanic and 13% uh, black. Okay, so national crisis, we need more underrepresented in STEM areas. We're here, so I like to say that we're here, you see us everywhere, just go down the street. I'm in Houston, Texas. And if I go down the street, I'm going to see a lot of black and brown. But I don't see them in the universities. I don't see them on the faculty of Rice University. We're here, but we're not there. So where do we earn our degrees? Okay. The Hispanics is civil engineering and sociology. Uh, African American sociology, political science. Females, sociology and psychology. White males, anything but sociology. Asians, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, okay? So we don't go into the areas as Hispanics and African-Americans, the STEM areas, the so-called STEM areas, we go into the, the 
the disciplines on the other side of campus. Now, I have a center and we do outreach and it's called uh, the Richard Tapia Center for Excellence and Equity in Education. And um, I run various outreach programs, okay? graduate programs, undergraduate programs. And um, ELA was Empowering Leadership Alliance. AGIP was uh, um, a program that produced graduate students that tried to get direct them to the professor. Okay? It was Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professor. Originally, were founded by NSF, but then we, I had to pick up support after NSF. Uh, the word you use is sunsetted. They no longer had money. Here's the Tapia Center. Now look at those beautiful pictures. I mean, they're beautiful because the people are beautiful, and there's so many of them. Okay, so we influence, and today we still have programs. We have summer programs for um, professional development for teachers. We have for uh, for high school uh, uh, students. And and so these are just pictures of the Tapia Center involved in various activities at various conferences. Okay. So the efforts from we were funded by NSF from 1999 to 2012. I mentored or worked with 89 PhD students. These are all underrepresented minorities. There are 31 African American, 24 Hispanic, non-Mexican, and 31 Mexican American, three Native American. 53 uh, men, 36 uh, women. So we made a mark. I mean, we really did a lot through the Tapia Center and through these programs. Um, so now I, I just mentioned that the new kid on the block are the Rice Tapia camps. We, we, we run them last year, they were remote. And we're gonna run them again this year, they're probably be remote. But we have these wonderful programs for uh, students that, who are uh, interested in STEM and professional development for teachers, okay? Okay, so let's go back and say, what about my life on the other side? I told you about my outreach life, but what about my professional life? Remember the delicate balance. The delicate balance is I want to do outreach, but I also want to be a mathematician, be recognized as such. So I have to balance those two things. And that is, you know, the hardest thing in my life is dealing with Cersei's death, okay? Or Jean's multiple sclerosis comes in next. But a very hard part of my life is essentially balancing those two aspects, okay? So in 1992, I was elected to National Academy of Engineering. I was first Latino in the history of the United States. In 2005, uh, I was selected as a university professor uh, at Rice University. That means I no longer belong to a department, I belong to the university, and it's the top level uh, uh, person or faculty that you can be in the university. So the first and only Latino, there have been six in the history of Rice University professors, which means that I, I get a lot of freedom and I get a lot of support and I can do a lot of things. Now, this is really a highlight. In 2011, I won the National Medal of Science. It was uh, awarded me by President Obama. And uh, my daughter, Becky, and our son, Richard and Jean, we went and we had Actually, a wonderful time in the White House. It, it was really something. So this is a picture that I'm very, very, very proud of, okay? That night, I, I closed my eyes and my mother was no longer alive. And I said, thank you, mother, for teaching us global excellence. And, I, and we've gotten to the top of the mountain. Here we are with the National Medal of Science. The National Medal of Science is the highest award given to a scientist or engineer in the United States, okay? So I made it to the top of that mountain and I never expected to get there, okay? So I had to ask, do I belong? Do I belong at the top of this mountain? And if you look at the names, I won't read them, of all these mathematicians who have won the National Medal of Science, I'd say, wow, I mean, look at them. Do I, Richard Tapia, belong in that group of all those people? I mean, those were my heroes okay, as I grew up. And so I had to say, no, I don't know how I got here. Do I belong? Okay. Now, as I questioned that, President Obama came out and his comments were, um, Richard, so he, when they, I was announced for the National Medal of Science, his comments were, not to everybody, there were seven of us, he said, Richard Tapia has given in directions that are critical for the health of the nation. He improved representation of women and minorities in mathematics and science. 
and he made a big thing about it. And so then I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I do belong because I've done math and I've done so much outreach. And I said, thank you, President Obama, for making me feel that I belong. Now, let's talk about Gene. Okay. Now, remember, I told you Gene is New Yorker. Okay. And uh, so when somebody came out, before President Obama came out, you know, they played Hail to the Chief. And, um, and, and, and you know, it's it an incredible moment. But a woman came out and said, don't yell. President Obama does not like yelling, just clap. So when they called my name, Jean just screamed and yelled and hollered and almost jumped out of her wheelchair. And President Obama looked at her and looked at me and I said, yes, that's my wife. And then I said to him, you have to understand she's Puerto Rican and Puerto Ricans yell a lot. And he didn't say anything, he just smiled and we went on. So that was Jean's performance. And she said to me that night, Richard, you knew I was going to yell. I mean, my side won. My side won. How can I sit there quietly? Okay. And so that was Gene's performance. Okay. So here's my concluding remarks. Okay. Believe in yourself. Si se puede. Maintain passion. You have to have passion for what you're doing. Okay. Learn survival skills. I will survive. That's what my mother taught us. Practice excellent work habits. That's what my mother taught us. Employ global standards. That's what my mother taught us. Make the world a better place. Okay. And trying to do things. Dream big. My dreams were always big. Gene's dream were always big. But deal with adversity as needed, success and failure. So I had, Gene and I had to say, we're not going to let this adversity uh, stop us. We're going to keep going. So you are dealt a hand uh, of cards. You can't turn it back in. You have to play it as well as you can. Okay. A message to students, your credentials precede you. They promote credibility and open doors. When I'm invited for talks like this one, People say, well, Tapia can't be a total turkey. He's won all these awards. And I always say to my students, be a professional who happens to be a minority, not a professional minority. I am a mathematician who happens to be Mexican-American. I'm not a professional Mexican-American. We serve as role models in two capacities. I serve as a role model to the youth, you, and to my majority colleagues. Concerning the latter, we want to show them. When I was on the National Science Board, uh, appointed by President Clinton, uh, that excellent comes in all flavors and that brown is a, a very nice flavor, okay? My guiding theme, I don't have to be the very best at everything, but I have to be good enough to succeed. If you sit on the porch with the big dogs and occasionally bark like a big dog, the world will view you as a big dog. And I had that opportunity from UCLA to Wisconsin to Rice, I got to run with big dogs. People say, ah, oh, Richard Tapia, must be a big dog because he's running with big dogs, okay? Now, I've always asked, what is my greatest uh, um, accomplishment? And I used to say the National Medal of Science by itself. But in the last couple of times I've given this talk, I said, no, last year, Gene and I had our 60th wedding anniversary. Now, Gene's been in a wheelchair since 1992, okay? And we had this gala event at a large hotel here in Houston. And so I say the two greatest accomplishments, National Medal of Science and 60th <clears throat> wedding, uh, 60 years of marriage. President David Lebron at Russian University was there and he said, there are many beautiful things to celebrate in the world. And one is the 60 years of marriage of Jean and Richard Tapia and the amazing love and support they have shown to each other and so many others. What a privilege to celebrate with them last night and much enjoy their dance. This is our dance, okay? There's uh, Jean and me, and um, the wedding dress is, is modeled after the wedding dress we had, she wore when we got married 60 years ago. And it, uh, it was a very wonderful event. And that is it. And I thank you for letting me share my life with you. And I hope that you 
have enjoyed it and it has motivated you in some ways. Well, Dr. Tapia, I will tell you it definitely for me, uh, um, and I'll say this personally has definitely motivated me. It has touched me uh, like very few other presentations that we've had along for a couple of reasons because of the accomplishments, accomplishments you've made for your dedication to our community, to our youth, for the love that you have to your wife and your family which I think it's incredible when an individual can balance all of it, can have that kind of love, dedication, and commitment to their family, to the students, to your profession. And so it is really has been a truly an honor to have you speak to our students and serve as an incredible role model for them. I will tell you, I'm looking at, at the, the questions coming in and also at the responses. Overwhelmingly, people are saying PhD. I do have a very creative person that said he would do 75% PhD and 25 racing. Um, so he would do 25% car. So I like that answer, but overwhelmingly people want to do um, the, the um, a PhD. I also have a comment uh, from an individual that's saying, thank you for the uplifting STEM talk. So other people besides myself feel the same way that it was a very uplifting an incredible talk uh, that in a presentation that you're sharing with us uh, regarding uh, your life. I would like to ask you as we wait for other questions to come in, what made you decide to study mathematician? I take it that you were good in math, but why mathematics? Because I was good at it. <laughs> it, it, it was the, the path of least resistance, okay? <laughs> Even you know in the first grade, like in the third grade, Mrs. Bentwood, who's a wonderful teacher, okay, one of the ones that usually where I grew up, the, you know, Mexicans were not put in the foreground, okay, but she did, and she would have me pronounce things in Spanish and say, "Oh, how beautiful!" But she said, "Look, you know this stuff. This is the third grade. You don't even have to do it. Why don't you go and tutor the people who don't understand it?" Okay. So it was really a path of least resistance. I didn't think rationally, why mathematics? Mathematics chose me, then I chose it. But I was always very good in math. In, in, in my high school, which was a crummy high school, I was clearly the best in the school. And it gave me, it's like stand and deliver. You know, as long as I didn't, the people didn't think I studied too much. I got a lot of recognition from the, everybody in the school as being cool because I was the best in mathematics, okay? And they didn't see me as this extreme nerd because Bobby and I were racing cars, okay? So cars, math, well accepted. It served me well. Math has served me very, very well. And it, it's provided a good life and it's provided a lot of people. And I get to meet people like you and Raul and everybody. So it's been very complete. So. It isn't this one narrow dimension of life being mathematics. It's exploded into many dimensions of so many opportunities to do so many things. Okay. And I give a lot of talks. Okay. I give a lot of talks on this and I get to share. And I, I have a series of lectures called Math is Cool. And one of them is about drag racing and mathematics. One is about BMX, bicycle racing and mathematics. And I have a whole series of these things. So I get to share beyond the classroom just to people and I do. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You know, that that's the, the thing I was thinking when, when I was thinking about you being a mathematician, the movie Stand and Deliver, and where Jaime Escalante tells the students math is in your blood. So so our community needs to remember that that math is in our blood. And maybe if they just apply themselves a little bit, we could have a lot more mathematicians in the world. Uh, one of the things that I would like to, to uh, mention also I know that you have um, advised and, and mentor uh, several PhD students that happen to be Latinos, which is the number that you have is not a small number. Not too many people get a chance to do that. Well, I, I, overall, I've had 35 PhD students and 15 of them have been women, okay? And Latinos is around, maybe around 18, okay? so. It isn't that I just said I'm going to work with these groups. It worked out really, really well. For example, I don't think anybody is directing more women in uh, mathematics PhDs than, than I have. Okay, and Latinos was fine, and that was part of the fulfillment 
and maybe maybe part of the fulfillment that I had to my mother. Okay, because my mother was the proudest Latina in the world. I mean, you know, I mean, she was just just so proud of being Mexican. You know, it was not, and um, so there was a commitment that I have there to reach back. I've been given good life in mathematics, so I have this opportunity and this commitment to give back. So it's an enjoyment, but I also saw it as a commitment. So yes, 18 Latinos, 15 women, 35 students, okay? And they're, they're an ex, they're, the, my students form an extend, a part of my extended family. Like some of my students will send my wife, Jean, on Mother's Day cards, okay? Or, you know, we just passed the holidays. And the number of messages I got from students all over the world, from all over the world, okay, from Paris, from Russia, from everything, was incredible. So, somos familia, somos familia, okay? It's not, okay, you got to now go. The relationship continues on and on and on for years and years and years. And that's the way I wanted to be. So, in some sense, I see myself as a father for all these students, okay? And I have students who got their degrees, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and they still continue to act as if they were part of our family. Yeah, no, you know, I, I small in a very small way. I work with students, as you know, and when I see them and they share, look, I got married, I have kids, I have this, and you feel like they're your extended children. So I understand what you're saying. Um, I have two questions that I'm going to try to combine because they have a little bit of the same question. One of them says he's really shines in other areas, but has a little trouble with math. And, and one of the other students says, how do you overcome anxieties on math? How do you do better in math if you don't think that you're um, good enough? Well, yeah, success will take you many places, okay? Success breeds confidence, okay? So what I tell students is don't jump in over your head. Take it and, and grab the mathematics that you're dealing with and learn it well. And don't go forward until you learn it well and you really understand it and success. As you know, Rafael, mathematics is one of those things that you can't just jump in at any point. You have to slowly build up and say, I know this and I'll go to this and I'll go to this. So to, in my life, I've had anxiety. I've had I don't belong. I've had imposter syndrome. And the way I argue is excellence will build confidence which will allow you to do those things so what i would tell students is just jump in with both feet don't shy away get it done get help from teachers that care or get help from uh tutors that care and and just go in there and have some successes and some understanding and make mathematics a friend okay now and, and and that's what I did. I, you know, math is my friend, and I feel good with it. So I, I think that the best way is to not run away, but to just jump in with both feet and master it at a low level, and then go forward and go forward and go forward. When I was at UCLA, I was not the fastest student by far. I mean, I had to take a lot of time to understand. But once I took the time to understand, I was pretty good. And a professor once told me, you ask good questions. And I didn't know what that meant. What does that mean that I ask good questions? Is, is that a compliment or is that an insult? Okay. And then I realized as I, my career developed, it was a compliment. See, because that means once I started to understand the material, I would ask good questions. And so that's it. Be confident with it. Just, you know, jump in. Don't, don't, don't think about it too much because then it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy and just go get it done. And, and that's a way, like my son, my son's a musician. He went to North Texas uh, uh, State in music, but he loves math. And he's always asking me math questions and things and stuff like that. And I just take a lot of time explaining to him, you know, how he sees it. And he asks good questions, but he knows no mathematics. I mean, he, he just, but he, he, math has already become a friend to him. Okay, and, and he knows, and I think that he didn't go into math because of me. I think because his father was in it, but also because he had such good musical talent. So, 
So I think that's what I'm saying. Be comfortable with it. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with what I know, and I'm not comfortable with what I don't know. Okay. So if you give me an area that I know well, I have no problem giving talks on things. On the other hand, it would be very naive of me to try to give a talk in something that I'm not comfortable with and that I don't know. Know it, get to know it. Yeah. Like Jean and her dance. I mean, Jean, knew, she, Jean was the world's greatest teacher. I mean, she, it was really interesting how she would teach young kids and older people. She didn't like teenagers. She said, I don't want to teach teenagers, okay? I'll let somebody else do that. But she was phenomenal with the young kids, you know, three and four and five, and with people over 50, okay? So you find where you fit, and you make it work. And you, if you can't build passion, then you have to question, are you doing something wrong? Okay. Yeah, to me, mathematics is beautiful. It's wonderful. And I love it. it. Says, you know, thank you for for your answer. I'll share with you Kathy's comment. And she says, thank you for sharing your life experience. It was really encouraging to me. Uh, and I'll never give up, up on my life journey. Uh, please know that your testimony has uh, no color line and encourages all people. Uh, we have a comment from Vanessa that also starts with, thank you so much for your presentation. It was so beautiful. I love the experience that you share uh, be between, uh, that you share with us between you and your wife. Congratulations on your success. You have been the best of all presentations. So I think we're starting the year off really good by having you as our first speaker of the year. And then I have another uh, individual that says, you know, I love math in college and I still love numbers. So we have individuals that you definitely are making a difference. You're motivating them. And hopefully some of our students will think about pursuing uh, mathematics as, as a career and also to be a faculty. We need more Latino faculties as one of your slide showed earlier. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, uh, my husband happens to have a 57 Chevy and loves cars just as much as you do. Um, did you ever race with your brother or was he the racer and you were only the mathematician? No, 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 no. When Bobby and I grew up at the age of 10, we bought a Model A at the age of 10 for $25, okay? And we took it apart and we built it. Then we bought a 32, 34. So Bobby and I were together, okay? We had to separate uh, uh, when I became a, a graduate student. But my, I, I told Bobby uh, once, you know, my love, Bobby, even though you were very successful as a driver, my love was just as strong as yours, okay? And and so, no. In fact, I even uh, drove the car once, okay? But Gene was so concerned that I was going to have an accident or something, so I didn't. But my passion and my love for cars, Rafael, it was clean. It was sincere. There was no dirt. It was just a clean passion for cars because we were 10, 11, 12, 13. By the time we were 16, we already had national records, okay? So then things got complicated because you know, women came into my life and that always complicates things, okay? But before, before women, there were cars, okay? And, and that, was, that was simple. But um, yeah, so, yeah, but you know, we had a split. I mean, you know, Bobby kept racing and, and he went on with a wonderful career and I became a mathematician. And after 1968, in 1968, Gene and I, and our son Richard and our, our daughter Sarah, went to Madison, Wisconsin, and spent two years at the University of Wisconsin. And that set my career in place. It was excellent. In my, se dice en español, en el fondo del corazón, okay, I still have a place for cars. You know that, okay? I mean, I, I, and, and the other day I was talking to someone and I said, they said, oh, is mathematics what you know best? And I said, no, probably not, probably cars. Okay, probably car, but I'm not actively involved, even though we still have uh, some toys in the garage. Okay. I have a uh, 78 Datsun 280Z with 7,000 original miles. It's it's the cleanest, you know, 280Z in 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 the world. Okay, and Gene, Gene says, after building heavy metal, Gene says to me, um, "Can we build another show car?" And, and I said, no, Gene, you know, that time in our life is gone. No, and anyway, it costs too much. Building that car costs a lot of money. Building that car today would have cost over half a million dollars. When I built it, it was $200,000, okay? But that's how much. And Gene says to me, this is 
typical good. She behaved like a Mexican on this. She said to me, Richard, if we need more money, let's sell the house and build a car. Okay. So when I grew up in Los Angeles, you know, I grew up in the, the, the Cheech and Chong days and all those things. But it was an expression I used to say, and this is supposed to be funny, I kind of think it is, is that because of the, the the sort of the culture of cars in California, okay, and especially with Latinos, I would say you can't be a self-respecting Mexican American, okay, unless your car is worth more than your house, okay. And that was always supposed to be a joke. But recently I used it with uh, uh, an executive at a company and he was driving a really fine car. And he told, and he, he's Mexican American. And he told me his wife was, who's not Mexican American, was very upset that they, he didn't need that car. And I told him, look, is your car worth as much as your house? And he said, no. Then tell your wife, you can't be self-respecting until your car is worth as much as your house. Well, I hope my husband is not hearing this presentation today. He often does, often does uh, join us to, to see what we're doing, but he has a love for cars, as I said that. He has spent a lot of money on his car, not yet as much as our house, and I hope he never does um, meet that, that goal. <laughs> so, so thank you for sharing that. Um, the, the other thing uh, that, that I was going to ask you, you mentioned uh, both of your children. And so did you at any point encourage them to pursue engineering or how did you um, allow them, uh, you know, or, or encourage them to pursue what they wanted? Because you said your son is actually in music. Yeah, no, I, I saw what their passion was. Okay. And like my younger daughter, Becky is so verbal. I mean, she was talking when she started talking, she was talking in sentences, not in words. Okay. Like who goes there? Who that? Okay, and so she has this incredible uh, facility for for uh, languages and for words, and so her undergraduate degree is in English, and her specialty was Shakespearean literature. Okay, that was a passion, and she had, you know, you do need talent in an area. You know, when people say anybody can be a mathematician, I mean, anybody can improve their math skills, but that doesn't mean anybody can be a mathematician. So Becky could never have been a mathematician, but she's incredible. I mean, she was really a hotshot in English in the classes that she took. And I went to a couple of like her senior thesis defense and she was taking care of the faculty. I mean, bam, bam, bam. And my son, on the other hand, you know, his, his music was always there. He was really strong in music. And, and um, he had uh, underground bands in the old days and stuff. So I just supported what their passion was, okay? Now, with Becky, it was clear. I mean, you know, you know, she, she no, no math. I mean, that was not. She was orthogonal to 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 mathematics. Okay, well, Richard, Richard may have been. I mean, he probably could do it. Okay, and he has clean thought, but you know, he stayed away from it. So I would support whatever they wanted to do because I thought that was the the correct thing to do. So I never pushed towards engineering and mathematics. Okay. If one of them had wanted to do that, I would have supported it, but that's okay. But I'm happy. I'm happy with, with, with what they do as long as they are, they are happy with what they do. And I mean, Richard, my son Richard, life is music, that's it. I mean, he is really, um, he has great talent and he also has great knowledge. Well, thank you. And I wanted to ask you that question because I think it's important for parents that are listening in today to know that it's wonderful. And, you know, Sarah is always committed to helping students to hopefully pursue STEM careers. But we definitely want students to pursue what really is, is um, their passion, what they're going to be uh, doing in their lives and excelling in those areas. Uh, hopefully some of them will pursue STEM careers as we need them uh, desperately. So thank you for, for sharing those words uh, with us, Dr. Tapia. Uh, we're almost running out of time, so I wanted to, to share two things with you. One is, is uh, congratulations again on your 60 years of marriage. Uh, to Jean, I think it's incredible. Kevin and I have a, a little bit of, of ways to go. We're gonna be celebrating our 39 on January 22nd. So we're, uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, a little bit over halfway there. 
and I love what you said uh, uh, that your Mary, your mother shared with you that uh, you know excellence comes in in all uh, flavors or in all colors as sometimes we say. I think it's really important for especially our youth to remember that excellence comes in all flavors, all colors, all sizes. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. And with that, I would ask, is there any other words or your last words that you would like to share with our audience? Just what you just said was excellent. Okay. In other words, believe in yourself. See, just believe in yourself. Okay. And, and, and work towards that goal. When I was on the National Science Board, President Clinton appointed me to the National Science Board. I went in. And the first meeting I got beat up. I mean, I mean, everybody was contradicting me and telling me these things. And so Jean, as a good Puerto Rican, she said, how was the meeting? And I said, they beat me up. And she said, I bendito. Next meeting, I'm going with you. Okay. And I said, no, Jean, you don't have to go with me. I have to find out what I did wrong. And what I did wrong is that I wasn't prepared. They give you a, a, a book, like uh, the week before you go to the National Science Board meeting, and they have the topics you're going to discuss. And what I would do is I would just look for topics that interested me, like representation or gender equity or under But then I didn't discuss the other things. And so I was losing credibility because I was too narrow. And so the chair of the board, his name was uh, Dick Zare from Stanford. He said, Richard, you're losing credibility because you're too narrow. So then I started saying, OK, I'm going to spend a lot of time, prepare myself and go in. And I, my objective was to say, I want somebody to say that Richard Tapia is one of the more important members of this board. And I did. I did. But I had to work at it and I had to think what I was doing wrong. Confidence and excellence will take you many, many places. And that's what I think I implicitly learned from my mother. And I certainly learned from trial and error here. Okay. I hold my high. Okay. And I, you know, and, and I'm proud to say, here I am, okay? And I don't come in excessively humble, okay? I'm not an excessively humble person, although I am respectful in all ways. And so I want the students to say, I believe in myself and I can do it, okay? And that's what I, I wanna do. And that's what I, and that's, that's my life. I mean, this is my story, this was my life, that's it. And I hope that people can learn from the things. Because there are ups and there are downs, and adversity comes. Adversity comes, and you deal with it. And Jean didn't want to deal with uh, Cersei's death, but I helped her, and we went to California. And in California, uh, she had her successes, and it was it was very rewarding. I will read two more more uh, comments. Uh, the the last few we're getting way too many to read all of them, but they say thank you again for a, a great presentation. Happy anniversary to you and your beautiful wife. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Be blessed and stay safe.